while you're still standing, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 14. And we're going to go straight into the reading of the Word. I, I have uh, just over 15 minutes, and uh, I'll, I'll take advantage of, full advantage of my time today. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to continue on the, the, the train of thought that we established last week. So if you could remain standing just for a moment longer. Open your Bibles with me to John chapter 14, verse 1. And we're going to read the first six verses. John chapter 14, verse 1. And uh, we're still in the series, The Upper Room Experience. And today is the ninth installment of this series. And today we're talking about the remedy, the remedy for a troubled heart, part two. Amen? Amen. John 14, 1. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. So it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house um, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Amen. Father, bless your word today. I pray that uh, you may speak to us and that our hearts may be opened to receive what you have to give today. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence that hovers over us. And, and, and we thank you for uh, your extraordinary mercy and your Holy Spirit, God, that abides helping us to understand your word and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wonderful. You can have a seat. Glory to God. So last week we started talking about <clears throat> the, the remedy for a troubled heart. And we, we've been uh, speaking about uh, in this series the upper room experience. Uh, for the benefit of those who have not followed the previous eight messages, I just want to kind of paint a picture of what we've been talking about. Um, uh, the, the upper room was, was a room, a, f a physical room that was built in, in the, the roof level of the houses in the Bible days. And these rooms were used for social interactions, in some cases for religious devotion. Uh, but they were a staple to the culture of the time. Uh, they didn't have basements back then, so what they built were upper rooms. They're kind of like we have an attic today, but it was a usable space. It was a social space. Sometimes it was open, even, uh, uh, the open walls. But, but it was a physical space uh, that was often used for social interactions or religious devotions. Now, uh, the reason why we're talking about the upper room experience is because we notice that uh, every time that there is an upper room in Scripture, something special happens. And, and, and for the past several weeks, we've been talking about each one of these events that take place in upper rooms throughout Scripture. Uh, whether it's the Acts 2 experience where the Holy Spirit comes down and that's the birth of the church. Or whether it's Acts chapter 20 when a, a young man named Eutychus is listening to Paul preaching and he falls asleep and he falls out the upper room and he, he dies in, in a fall. And Paul rushes down and prays for him and he comes back to life. Uh, whether it's uh, Jesus' last sermon to his disciples in John chapters 13 through 17, all of this takes place in an upper room. And therefore, we've established that the upper room is symbolic of this higher level of relationship with the Lord, where uh, our perception is heightened. It's uh, where our understanding is, is fertile, that we can receive from the Lord that, that which he is trying to give. It's, it's, it's like establishing a stronger connection with him. 
Uh, uh, it's the difference between being connected to Wi-Fi and being hardwired into the network. It's, it's, there's a difference there. Uh, uh, and, and that's what the upper room symbolizes. It's a place of proximity. It's a place of elevation. And it's a place of exclusivity. Uh, and understanding that that is what the upper room is symbolic of, we've, uh, we've established the, the urgency for us to develop in our lives uh, an upper room for us to cultivate because it's a place that you prepare for your personal relationship with the Lord. An upper room. Why, why, Pastor Diego, the upper room? Because the upper room is this, is, is, there's the symbolism of elevated positioning. Not that I'm better than the rest of the world. Not at all. On the contrary, because the upper room is a place where our necessity to serve becomes apparent to us. Uh, and, and it's where we uh, assume the identity of, of servants. We are servants in the kingdom of God. So it's not this place of pride. It's not. It's a place of humility. But it's elevation in regards to that everything that happens outside of the upper room doesn't affect my relationship with the Lord. Do you, do you follow me? Amen? So, so that's why we've been talking about that. We've been talking about the need for us to have an upper room experience. And we need to have it. Uh, and, and last week we started talking about the, the, the remedy to a troubled heart. Because Jesus in chapter 14 of John, Jesus speaks about, uh, uh, he begins the chapter and he ends the chapter with the same statement. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. And you have to understand the, 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 um, uh, the, the context in which Jesus is saying this to his disciples. He is not saying this to his disciples as they're going out on vacation or they're getting ready to go to a cruise. He's not saying this to them as they are being promoted in their job and making more money. Or the, no, no, he's saying this to them in a moment where they... They don't know it yet, but they are about to see Jesus being punished publicly and put to death in public. Jesus, who is their mentor, their, their master, their rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. He is their, his, their teacher, their rabbi, their master. They see him as the Messiah, the, 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 the one anointed one sent by God to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Imagine the level of expectation they have for this guy. Not only that, but just prior to this conversation that we just read, Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem mounted on a donkey. And, and everybody was, call, uh, was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were uh, 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 celebrating Jesus, laying uh, palm leaves on the way for him to go by as, as he enters into the city. So the, the mindset of these guys is at a place where, whoa, it's all happening now. Jesus is going to take care of the Romans. He is bringing back the glory of the, the Israeli nation and he is bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. This is our moment. And that's what their mindset is. They don't know it but just a few hours after this conversation they're going to see Jesus being betrayed by one of their own, Judas Iscariot. They're going to see Jesus being imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. They're going to see Jesus be tortured in public. They're going to see Jesus be crucified. And they're going to see Jesus die before their very eyes without being able to do a thing about it. And before all of this, Jesus says to them, let not your heart be troubled. That is what the upper room experience is about. The upper room experience is about such a close connection with the Lord that whatever happens outside of your God-given purpose will not affect your state of connection with the Lord. And Jesus says this, he says, let not your heart be troubled. And at the very end of the chapter on verse 28, he says it again. Or uh, of um, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So Jesus was preparing them for what was to come. He was giving them the remedy to a troubled heart. And I think it's, it's very pertinent to, uh, for us especially. It's, it's, it's very applicable to us. Because uh, the troubled heart is, is the... the um, the disease of our generation. 
Whether it's the anxiety or the depression or, or, or the stress or the overwhelming nature of our current generation of process, so much information that is being thrown to us at every given moment. Uh, everything is just so uh, at the tip of our fingers that it overwhelms us. And that's why we see today a generation that is so easily triggered, that's so easily depressed, that's so easily anxious, that is that it that it has not that that doesn't have access to the peace which the Bible speaks of. The world does not have access to this peace. And, and that's why I think it's so important for us to not only hear about this, but truly apply this in our lives because we are not one of us is immune to living through a season of a troubled heart. All of us are susceptible to, susceptible to this. We're all susceptible uh, to, to, to living through a season of anxiety. And that's why we need an upper room because that a relationship with the Lord is the only way for us to remedy the troubles of the heart. The troubles of the heart. And we started last week speaking about what is, in fact, the remedy of the troubled heart. And we started by saying that the first thing we ought to do is retake control. Say that with me. Say retake, retake. control. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. So Jesus is giving us important direction as to what we ought to do. What Jesus is, is relating to us is that we are the gatekeepers of our hearts. And, and that, to me, from, to my understanding, that goes so against the current culture because now everybody is triggered. Now everybody is being canceled. Now everybody is culpable to my offense. And everybody offends me. Everything offends me. And because something offends me, I have to cancel it. I have to do away with it. Well, whether it's a, a song or a joke or a person or an action or a tweet, regardless of what it is, I have to cancel it because it offends me and I have to take it out of the world as if it never existed and nowadays we are eliminating we're eliminating so many things as if it were the the you know my neighbor's responsibility or the government's responsibility to keep me from being offended but it's not I'm the one who is the gatekeeper of my heart and that's what Jesus says he, he says listen you can't control what happens outside of you. You control what enters into your heart. So Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You are the gatekeeper. You, you can't let your heart be troubled. You see, church, in order for trouble to find your heart, you have to allow for it to enter in there. Do you follow what I'm saying? You have to allow for it. So Jesus says, don't let it happen. And the problem is that we have been nowadays deferring our responsibility. Everybody else is responsible for my happiness. Everybody else is responsible for my well-being except for myself. Everybody else is responsible for my sanity except for myself. Everybody else is responsible for my decisions except for myself. Everybody else is responsible for my finances except for myself. And Jesus makes it clear. He says, listen, your heart is your responsibility. Your heart is your responsibility. As much as you can try, if I have my mind made up, you can call me anything you want. You will not offend me because I won't let my heart be troubled. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you say. Yes. I won't let it happen to me. Yes. Yeah. Do you follow me, church? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is so vital. Why is this so important? And this is the reason why we need to cultivate an upper room environment in our lives. It's because without this relationship with the Lord, it's very difficult to not allow these troubles of life to affect us. Yeah. It's very difficult. If, if the Lord matters to us most, then we will not allow ourselves to be affected by these things. And that's why our relationship with Jesus is so powerful. We cannot defer the responsibility of being the gatekeepers of our hearts. 
We can't. I cannot defer the responsibility of being a good husband to anybody else. It's my responsibility to be the best husband I can be to my wife. To be the best father I can be to my sons. It's my responsibility to be the best pastor that I can be for this church. I can't defer this responsibility to anybody else. I cannot allow my heart to be troubled by anybody else's decision. By anybody else's posture. I've made my decision. I've made my decision to stand to be steadfast, to stand firm, to stand my ground. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks or does. It doesn't matter. I have made my decision. I will be a godly husband to my wife. I will be a good father to my children. I will be a good pastor to this church. I will be a disciple of Jesus above all else. How many of you are with me today, church? Somebody say, I will not allow my heart to be affected by external things. I cannot allow it. I got to retake control. Turn your neighbor and tell him, retake your control. Yeah, don't, don't give anybody else the remote control to your heart. Don't let anybody else control your emotions. Don't let anybody else ruin your day. It's not their responsibility. It's your responsibility to live a life that is connected to the goodness of God. God has been good to me. And his goodness overshadows any evil thing that any evildoer can ever try to do. His goodness speaks louder than what anybody else can say in a press conference. Don't give anybody else the remote control. Don't do it. Don't do it. You know, in my house, we have one of those smart TV uh, little uh, gadgets. Uh, it's like an Apple thing. And there's a tiny remote control, which is, it, that remote control has been designed and engineered to be lost yeah. in the house. Yeah. You know, like a group of engineers got together and they thought that their question was, how can we create a remote control that loses itself? <laughs> and then that's what they created, essentially. So in order to remedy that, they made an app for your phone that you can control the device from your phone. So, uh, you know, sometimes Noah is, is down in the basement watching his, his uh, cartoons or um, whatever. And he has the control in his hand. And I, I sneak in the stairs. I sneak down with my app and I just, I pause it. And then, he's, <laughs> and then he plays it again. And then I, I, I exit the program he's watching. He gets so angry. And then he looks in the stairs. He doesn't know it. But, but I have the control to what he's watching. <laughs> I wonder, have you given your boss the remote control to your emotions? Have you, have you given your, your neighbor or your governor or your president? Or have you given, have you given the, 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 I don't know what your favorite TV show is or cable TV. Or have you given Fox News or CNN? Have you, have you given the Twitter, the remote control to your heart? There are people that legitimately cannot have a good day if they look at Twitter in the morning. Have you given Instagram the key to your heart, the, the remote control to your heart? So if you don't get 30 likes on your picture, you're not going to have a good day. What type, of, what type of mature Christian are you if you need validation from people who don't even know you? I'm preaching much better than you're shouting today. Amen. Somebody say, let not your heart be troubled. Yeah, retake control, retake control. That's what this message is about. This message is about cultivating an upper room so that my emotions will not be rattled by what the enemy tries to throw against me. I will not be rattled. I refuse to because I have an upper room where I hear the voice of my Lord. I know what he says. I know his promises towards me. And therefore, I retake control of my heart. I will not let it be troubled. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody say retake control. retake control. Number two is renew your faith. Number one is retake control. Number two, renew your faith. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. 
Believe in God, believe also in me. So it's, it's a matter of trust. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? And trust is all about relationship. You don't trust overnight. You don't do that. You don't trust overnight. Trust takes time. Are you with me? Trust takes time. Yes, trust takes time. And what God is saying is, what Jesus is saying is, he's saying, place your trust in me. In other, in other words, you need to get to know me to the point where you trust him blindly. And that is what the relationship with the Lord is about. That's why we need an upper room. Somebody say, renew your faith. Number three, we said, recalibrate your hope. So number one, retake control. Number two, renew your faith. Number three, recalibrate your hope. And he says on verse two, he says, uh, can you put it on the screen for us, please? John 14, two. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If, if, um, if not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. So he, he goes into, he, he's, trying to, he's trying to tell them, don't be troubled. And instead of giving them a more practical advice, and I put that in quotes because he does give a practical teaching, but it's not what we expect it, it would be. You know, if it were me, I would say, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, try to eat healthy, wake up early, you know, grab the morning sun, take a walk every now and again, you know, do, do things that causes you to be active and, and be lifted up. That's not what he says. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Renew your faith. And then he says, recalibrate your hope. He says, in my father's house are many dwellings. So he points to eternity. And that is what the gospel message is about. The gospel message is a message about eternity. And we have to renew our hope in eternity. You know, oftentimes, so many people, preachers and churches that neglect to mention how special our hope in eternal life truly is. And we cannot be ashamed of it. That's why Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And this is the gospel message. I cannot be ashamed of it. Oh, pastor, but that sounds so, so, it sounds like a fantasy. It sounds like a sci-fi movie. It sounds like a, you know, one of those CGI created universes. It sounds like, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. That is my hope. My hope is eternity with my Lord. And at the the, at the moment that that hope doesn't excite us, that is the moment that we started losing faith. And the reason why some of us are so susceptible to anxiety is because our hope is placed on things of this world. Our hope is not on things above. And Jesus, he immediately points to eternity and he says, in my father's house. There are many mansions. So somebody say with me, retake control. Retake control. Renew, your faith. Renew your faith. Recalibrate your hope. Recalibrate your hope. Yes. yes. Now, I want to give you just one new thing today before we wrap it up. I'm, I'm pretty much over time, but I won't be long. The one thing I want to give you is what he says at the end of our reading. At the very end of our reading, he says, uh, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus, at this point, he enters into a, a section of this teaching where he talks about relationship and obedience because because uh, uh, he, he begins verse 7 he says if you had known me so knowledge of him relationship do you follow he says if you had known me you would have known my father also and from now on you know him and you have seen him. So now he gets into the ex this exchange with Philip because Philip says, oh, show us the father and, and that, will, that will be enough. And Jesus says, you've been me with me for so long and you don't know the father yet? 
Uh, and he goes into verse, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? It's all about relationship. It's all about knowledge. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father. Uh, verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, uh, 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 I say to you, he who believes in me, the works uh, that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. So he's, he's talking about relationship. He's talking about knowledge of him. Why? Because of verse 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So remember, we're talking about the remedy to a troubled heart. The remedy to a troubled heart. This up-close relationship with him. Not only relationship, but also obedience. So he goes into verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So love and obedience. Do you follow? Love and obedience. Uh, So relationship, relationship and obedience. Love and obedience. Verse 16. I will pray to the, uh, I will pray to the Father. He will give you another helper. And he may abide in you forever or with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you. And will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So through the end of verse 18, he is speaking about a relationship with him of love and obedience to Jesus. So he is, he is teaching us what is most important in our interaction with the Lord. In other words, What is most important is not what he can do for me. What is most important is for me to be enlightened as to who he is. And once I'm enlightened uh, regarding who he is, everything else falls into place. Because if I know him, I trust him. If I know him, faith is restored. And if I have faith in him, then hope is recalibrated. Do you follow? It's, it's like a domino effect. So he is reverse engineering a, a place of excitement and hope in the Lord and in our salvation. He is, re, he is reverse engineering it. He, is, he says, listen, you need to retake control. You need, to, you need to retake control. You need to renew your faith and you need to recalibrate hope. And all of that happens when you know who I am. And it, there's a difference. I remember uh, in Bill's testimony, he says, I, I knew a lot about Jesus, but, but I found people who love him here. You know, that's, that's what the gospel is about. It's from going, uh, it's from, going from, uh, um, from knowing about Jesus to knowing who Jesus truly is. It's the difference from knowing about him and knowing him. It's the difference of knowing of him and knowing him. It's the difference between recognition, oh my God, and knowledge. Let me give you this difference, all right? So recognition is a, it is a, a, a sign of immaturity. Let me show you this. So I have a, a, a little son, a two-year-old. He's running around here somewhere. His name is Joshua. If Joshua walks in the room, he's going to see everybody, but he's going to recognize me to be his father. So he's going to come straight to me. And he's going to come straight to me. He's going to ask for a hug and he's going to ask to be picked up. And then as I go to pick him up, he's going to run away because that's what he does. Because he recognizes me. But he doesn't know me. What do you mean, Pastor Diego? He doesn't know me yet because he's not mature enough. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what food I like to eat. He doesn't know what movies I like. He doesn't know what my favorite book is. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what I do for a living. He doesn't, he's not mature yet. So he doesn't know me. He recognizes me, but he doesn't know me. I, I love him because he's my son. He didn't do anything for me. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. He's, act, he's come to think of it, he's a little brat. 
He cries a lot. He wakes me up at 5 o'clock in the morning every day. Do you know you follow me? He doesn't, he doesn't help my life in any way, shape, or form. My love for him is unconditional. Good God of mercy. He did nothing to, res- to deserve my love. All that he did was be born. And that's it. The second he was born, he took my wife from me, her time, her attention, her energy, every, but I still love the little guy. My love for him is unconditional and he doesn't know me. He doesn't know me. He recognizes me, but he doesn't know me. I, I, I'd say even that some of you know me more than my son does. Why? Because of his maturity level. There will come a point where he will mature to a point where he will know me. He will know me. He will know what I'm thinking. He will know what I love. He will know, what I, he will know that I like Indian motorcycles. You will know that. He will know it. And that is the difference, church. That only happens through maturity, through relationship. That only happens in the upper room. When you go from recognition to knowledge, God doesn't want you to just recognize him. Oh, Pastor Diego, I came into church today. Wow, I felt something different. I got goose pimples. The gospel isn't about goose pimples. Oh, I felt, I felt, I felt tingly. So what? Titanic made me feel tingly. (laughs) Should I begin to praise Leonardo DiCaprio? So, so, so church, it's not about, it's not about the physical feeling. No, no, no. It's about knowing him. Is this helping anybody? So once you know him, you, def- you can stand on your feet. I'm done. I'm 15 minutes over time. I'm done. So once we begin to know him, we, we, this relationship of interest, because at first we're just interested in what God can do. Mm-hmm. Oh, God can heal me. God can deliver me. God can take me out of this. God can take me out of that. God can restore my marriage. God can help my kids. God can do this. God can help my finance. God, we're initially, it's all out of interest but then we develop an upper room and we go from recognition to knowledge and we begin to relate to who he is and then love is developed once love is developed obedience is the fruit and that is that is the end game of the upper room experience of the gospel is to bring you to a place of knowledge, love, and obedience. Because at the end of the day, He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. If you could close your eyes, just grab your neighbor by the hand, squeeze that hand, allow the virtue of the Lord to flow through you. I pray, God, that you may touch every life here in this place. Father, whether it's retaking control or or whether it's renewing hope or renewing faith or recalibrating hope. Father, whether it's, whether it's the, the stage of, of knowledge or developing love for you or entering into obedience of your word and having pleasure and joy out of it. Father, I pray that you may touch every brother and sister here today in their, own, in their own journey, wherever they may be. Maybe there are people here who don't really know who you are and are taken back by this sermon because, because they don't trust you just yet, because they don't know you. I pray that your Holy Spirit may touch and bring about a, a, a spiritual... A, a spiritual a, 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 a spiritual openness to their hearts. 
as your Holy Spirit begins to make himself known to every single person here today. And Father, at that point, may love be born in our hearts for you. And may obedience be the fruit of that love. Father, I pray that you may reveal yourself and that your love may be felt and lived out. In Jesus' name. And to anybody, Father, that in the silence and the privacy of their thoughts are reaching out to you right now, I pray with them and I declare that forgiveness and grace may abound. In Jesus' name. Father, bring us home in safety. Multiply unto us your grace and your favor continuously. Thank you for this wonderful day of celebration of the new birth. I thank you for the life of everybody who was baptized today. And I, I, I pray that their journey that starts today may be a fruitful journey. A fruitful journey of love, of knowledge, and of obedience to you and your word. In Jesus' name. May the blessings of the Lord God the Father, the grace of Christ the Son, may the comfort of the Holy Spirit be upon His church today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want you to clap your hands as hard as you can, somebody. Hallelujah. Glory to God.